Do you want to know more about hashing and salting passwords for your native script apps? I recently released a course on nativescripting.com called Securing Native Script Applications. Among other security-related topics that are in the course, this course has a few chapters dedicated to authentication and authorization. We use different methods to log into your native script apps, like social providers, Google and Facebook being some of them, as well as your own authorization server. I break down the steps that are involved in the process of authorization. There's connections going this way, that way, and they come back and, you know, it's a long process. I break it down for you and we build the process from scratch. That way you really gain an understanding of what's going on when you use a third-party provider or third-party API, like Google's APIs or Facebook's native APIs or whatever you're using. So I thought I'd share one of the lessons from the course right here on YouTube. This one has to do specifically with hashing and salting passwords. And we'll be back to regular tutorials in the next video. In this lesson, we're gonna use a third-party library to perform hashing and salting of our passwords before we store them. Right now, we have this user.json file, which is storing passwords in clear text, which is a big no-no in security. I'm gonna delete this file and hopefully nobody will see this and I won't be embarrassed that I had this. Okay, let's go out to our terminal in our server project and I'm gonna issue the command npm install bcryptjs dash dash save. Let's take a look at our package.json file. All right, so there's bcrypt.js. And I'm also gonna install the TypeScript typings for it. So npm install at types bcrypt.js dash dash save dev. Great, so now this library bcrypt.js is available for us to use on the server side. And now we don't have any excuse not to hash our passwords. bcrypt uses very strong cryptography algorithms and it mitigates any kind of brute force attack because you can affect how slowly it encrypts your passwords. Now this of course is at the expense of some user experience when you're logging in and when you're registering your users, but it helps secure them. You have to walk that fine line between user experience and security. So we're in this server project. Let's open up our util file where we have this new GUID function I'm going to import a couple of things from the bcrypt library here. Now you can see that we can import gen salt and gen salt sync. One is asynchronous and one is synchronous. I'm gonna use the synchronous versions here, but it doesn't matter, you can use the async ones as well. So I'm gonna stick with synchronous ones and here I'm gonna import the hash sync function as well. So one of them is for salting and one of them is for hashing. And I want to create a function that's going to process my passwords. So I'm gonna create a function called hash password and pass in an unhashed password, which is gonna be a string. And I'm gonna return another string that's gonna be the hashed password. So first I wanna generate a salt. We're gonna use the gen salt sync function here. And this takes in rounds. So this is the number of rounds to use with 10 being the default. What does this mean? Well, it's essentially a cost. So it's a number of times the hashing algorithm will run through. For example, for the default, which is 10, the internal function will process 1,024 times. And for every number you add, so if you go to 11, this will process twice as many times, so 2,048. The maximum is 16, so if you go all the way up to 16, this will process 65,536 times which is gonna be about 10 seconds. And that's a very poor user experience. So you have to pick and choose what you're going to do here. I'm gonna go with 12 because I feel like that's a good balance between strength and time. So now that's gonna generate our salt. And the salt here is gonna be stored as part of the hash password. So we don't need to maintain the salt separately. It's gonna be part of the hash. And the same bcrypt library is gonna be able to determine and verify the salt from the hash. Now I'm going to generate the hash password using the hash sync function. I'm gonna pass in the original password and the salt. And then let's go ahead and return the hashed password. So at which point do we need to use this function? Well, when the user first registers for the account, that's the best time to do this. After that, it's already too late. So let's go to our user's index controller here and let's find our register function, 
Here it is. We get our password passed as part of the request. What I'm going to do is create the hash password, hash password, and I'm going to pass in that password that's coming from the body. And let's import this. Oh, this should be hash. That's why it's not picking it up. Okay, so let's import that. And now that we have the hash password, instead of passing in the actual password, I'm going to pass in the hash password to the user data when we create the user. Let's save everything and build this application. And I'm going to launch this. Okay, so remember, I've deleted our user file. There's nothing in there right now. Let's run the app and see what kind of password we get generated. So I'm going to go to the sign up page and I'm just going to keep my hard coded values in there and tap sign up. Your account has been created. Okay, so now we have this users file that was generated and I'm going to save this to reformat it. Okay, so there's our user object. We have the clear text email address here, but our password is now hashed. You cannot tell what the password is and the salt is part of this hash as well. Now our login function won't work, of course, because we're matching this password with the one passed in. So when we're logging in, we need to use another one of bcrypt's functions to verify the password. Let's go back to our utils and we need to export another function that's going to verify the password. It's going to take in the password attempted and the password that's hashed in the database and it's going to compare them. This function is going to return a boolean that if it's true means the passwords match and we need to import one more function from bcrypt and that's compare so compare also comes in the async and the sync flavors i'm going to use the sync flavor and i'm going to return compare sync this takes in two passwords first is going to be the password attempted and then the hashed password it's as simple as that sometimes security is not that hard you just need to take a couple of extra little steps Let's go to our user controller and in the login function, we need to do a couple of things here. We need to fetch the user, but now we need to verify the password. I'm going to call this password matches and we're going to call that verify password function, passing in the password that comes in on the request body and the found user's password. This will fail if the user is not found. Let's go ahead and bring this in right over here and we'll do one more step here. If password matches, then we're finally going to go ahead and return user logged in. Otherwise, we'll just return this message again, a 403 forbidden message. Save everything. Let's build and run this. And let's go back to the app. I know this user already exists with a hash password. I'm going to change this to a different password that doesn't match. I'm going to make this all H's. Sign in. Okay, we get a message. Sorry, we couldn't log you in. What if I try the correct password, which is password, sign in, and we're in. In this lesson, we'll generate our token. The token is signed by a secret that we're going to store on a server side, and the server will be able to validate the tokens using this secret. One thing to keep in mind about JOTs is that they can't be revoked, but they can expire. This is important to know because a potential attacker can get a hold of your access token and potentially use it for a long time if it hasn't expired. So make sure you keep your expiration relatively short. In our example app, we'll use a one hour expiration. The token is actually signed by a secret that we're going to store on our server side and the server will be able to validate the tokens using this secret. So in our server, I'm going to go to the terminal and I'm going to install another library. This library will allow me to read my local environmental variables that I have in my project. So npm install, and this library is called .env. You'll see why it's called that in a second. I'm gonna save that as a dependency. Now, I want to store a secret somewhere on my server side so that it won't be passed back and forth between the client and the server. Think of this as the private key. This should not be shared. So right here next to your server.ts file, I'm gonna create a .env file. And this is just a file for storing key value pairs. So I'm going to call my key secret and I'm going to give it some value. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to call it something legible, my special secret. We're never going to actually read this. It's just going to be used by the hashing algorithm to sign the jot. We have this .env file and now we can read it using our .env library. Let's go ahead and do that. 
open up your util file again, and we're going to create another utility function here for creating tokens. So I'm going to export a function and I'm going to call it create token. So this will create the jot for us. We're going to base this jot on some user information. So we're going to pass in a user. This is that model that we've created earlier in the course. Remember, our payload in the jot can contain any information we want. So I will pass in the user ID and the email as my payload. So that's going to be my payload. And my secret is going to be read from the .env file. And the way we access it is by using process.env. And we're going to pass in the key that we used for our secret, which is just secret. So I'm going to save that as a secret. And there we go. So now we have the payload and the secret. We're pretty much ready to create our token, but we need one more library in order to do so. Let's open up our package.json file so we can watch it. And let's go down here to the terminal and npm install this library called JSON Web Token and save that as a dependency. Okay, there it is. And this library also has type declarations, which we're going to install now. Excellent. So back to our util. Now we're finally ready to create our token. We're going to use the sign function, which gets automatically imported from JSON Web Token right here. Sign takes in a few things. The first thing is the payload. We've already created that. The second is the secret. We have a reference to that as well. And finally, we're going to take in an object, which is uh, the sign options. So here we can specify the algorithm we want to use, which is going to be the SHA-256 algorithm. And here's an important one. This is the expiration of the token. Now to make your tokens secure, you want to make sure that you expire them pretty often. You don't want an ongoing unexpired token and somebody accidentally getting a hold of it and then they're able to create some damage on your system. So make sure you expire these and then if somebody needs another token, they can always go ahead and get it by verifying their account. So I'm going to set a pretty short expiration of one hour. The sign function is actually going to return to us the sign token itself. So it's going to be a string and we're going to return that signed token from this function. So that's it. This is how we create a jot and sign it on our server side. Now, of course, there's equivalent libraries that you can use for .NET, Python, and so on. But your workflow essentially is going to be the same. So at which point do we need to use this create token function? Well, when the user logs in, we want to be able to give them something in return saying, OK, here's a token for you. You've signed in successfully and you can use this token next time you ask for any resources. So we're going to use this in our users controller when we log the user in. So here we are in the login user function. We're going to find the user. We're going to validate the password. And if the password matches, we want to go ahead and generate a token. So here we're going to create a jot by using our create token function. We're going to pass in our user. And in our response, we're going to send back a JSON object with a message, which we're already doing. But along with that, we're going to create a new property here called access token. And we're going to send that jot back. Let's quickly compile this and launch our server. And let's take a look at the app side. After we log in, we're going to get a result. And that's that message and the jot. So we're interested in getting that result. And the way we do that here is by using the pipe operator with RxJS 6 and higher. And we're going to use the tap function so we can access that result. Tap is not imported, so we need to import tap from RxJS operators. I'm going to go ahead and paste that in right there. And for now, I want to go ahead and log out the token that we get back. So token received result access token. OK, I'm going to go ahead and sign in. Make sure we have an account and sign in. Hmm. And for some reason, our secret is undefined on the server side. So let's see what's going on here. Of course, I need to require this library that we've imported, and that's the .env library. And I want to call the load function so that it loads the environmental variables. That's a very important step to take. Now I'm going to open up the console so I can see the output, and I'm going to tap sign in. And we are signed in. And as you can see here, we've got our token. I'm going to go ahead and copy it. And let's just finish up this chapter by looking at what the token looks like. So I'm going to go to this JWT.io site and I'm going to paste in my token. And as you can see, we have our algorithm and our type. And here's our data. We have the user ID, the email, 
the time when the token was created and the expiration time, which is an hour later. So our token works, but how do we use it on the client side? Let's take a look at that next. We've implemented JOT generation on the server side and we're returning the token to our client on login. Let's store that token properly in our NativeScript app. Here is the NativeScript app and we've got the auth service open. And this is where we are receiving our token from the server. Once we receive the token, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, first of all, we have to store it somehow. And a token is a very sensitive piece of data on your client. Somebody else can get a hold of your token and use it to access the same information that you can on the server or write to the server, which is even worse. So you have to be careful how you store this data on the client. Now, a typical way to do local storage in a native script application is by using the app settings module. Here in the auth service, we are already using the app settings module to store our is authenticated flag. Let's create another pair of getters and setters for our token. So I'm going to create a function called get token. This is a public function and it's going to return a string. And we're going to use the application settings module and we're going to use its get string method. Now we haven't specified a key yet for the token. So let's go up here and create a constant. And that's going to be our access token key. Our token is a string. So we're going to use the get string override and I'm going to pass in that access token key. Before we can get the token, we should be able to set it. I like to make this function private until we really need to expose it, which I don't think we will in this case because our auth service is the one responsible for setting the token in the first place. So I'm going to create a set token function here, which is going to take a value as a string, which is the access token and return void. Here we're going to use the app settings module to set a string with the access token key and we're going to pass along the access token itself. Great. So now that we've logged in and we've received our token, we can call set token and pass in our token. Later on in the course, we're going to look at other ways to store this token locally that's going to be more secure than application settings. And we'll take a look at the differences and the similarities between different storage types. But for now, app settings will do. So this is how we store the token locally. What do we do with it once it's stored? How do we use it on the client? And we'll take a look at that next. All right, well, I hope they gave you some idea of what we do to secure our native script apps. Now go build something and make sure it's secure, okay? And I'll see you in the next video. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you never miss any tips, tricks, or tutorials that we have here. See you next time.